Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday and happy Pride Month. Welcome to today's Lunch and Learn. It's so wonderful that you all can join us today. Thank you. I'm Alexi Collins, the Racial Justice Director here at the YWCA of Northwest Ohio, where we're dedicated to eliminating racism, empowering women, and promoting peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all. I would also like to acknowledge today our partnership with Healthy Lucas County and Fostering Healthy Communities, um, a collaboration among Mercy Health, ProMedica, and the University of Toledo Medical Center in helping us to continue this work. So today we have a special treat for you. Our topic for today is operationalizing love in our social justice and healing work. And so I'd like to introduce you to our wonderful presenter, Darrell Brooks, PhD, is an interdisciplinary researcher and scholar practitioner from Baltimore, Maryland. He is also the founder and CEO of Love and Justice Consulting, LLC, an organization that provides leaders with diversity and social justice learning opportunities to increase their capacity to effectively and authentically engage difference through dialogue, critical self-reflective practice, and compassionate communication, Durrell holds space for others to do meaningful work that liberates and transforms the personal and collective for our common good. In this work, he offers leaders executive coaching and thought partnership as they navigate embedding intersectional justice frameworks and values into everything that they do. So without further ado, I will turn things over to Dr. Brooks and take it away. Thank you so much, Alexi, for the invitation um, and greetings, everyone. Um, I am excited to be with you today. I'm gonna put up my PowerPoint slide so that we can dive right into this uh, really important topic. So first, I just want to say uh, happy Pride Month. Um, I'm excited um, on this last day of Pride uh, to sort of um, hold space for sort of what's going on in the world in this moment. Um, as we uh, saw uh, the Supreme Court uh, sort of impact and sort of begin to dismantle not only affirmative action, but also on this uh, last day of Pride. Um, also allow for the discrimination um, of some businesses for LGBT folks. And I just kind of want to take a moment to acknowledge that sort of how far we've come, but how much more work that we need to do. Um, and so I just invite us into a moment of sort of uh, silent reflection um, and pause as we think about sort of uh, what brings us to this session and, um, and how we're sort of experiencing and navigating this particular political moment. And so uh, one of the things that um, I believe it is important to, to sort of let you all know is that uh, this session um, really uh, came out of uh, a long body of work that I've been doing uh, probably over for the last maybe 10, 12 years uh, about sort of understanding what does it mean for us uh, to sort of uh, not have robust definitions of love uh, sort of that are pervasive in our society. And so what I'm going to do is, um, uh, as we sort of begin to have this conversation, uh, wanting to sort of create a moment of, of reflection and to think about, like, if, if I had to ask you right now, if I walked up to you and saw you on the street and I said, so what is your definition of love? Um, sort of what would you say? Would it take you a few moments to get it together? Like, or can you just sort of rattle it off like that? Um, and no matter where you enter um, and sort of your response or the frequency or, or where it sort of allowed you to sort of enter uh, in that moment, um, to understand sort of where, where, did, where, did you, where did that come from? Where did your particular definition of, of love come from? Um, and most importantly, um, what do you think your definition of love has to do with sort of progressing and advancing our society toward um, deeper racial justice, LGBT justice, intersectional justice um, as we do this work? And as Alexi mentioned, I um, uh, am a doctor. And so one of the things that I've been doing um, and studying over the last 10 or so years um, is uh, been centered on healing race, gender, and sexuality-based trauma. Um, I have a body of work that really focuses on specifically on um, intimate partner violence prevention um, for LGBT young folks, um, especially um, 14 to 24-year-olds 
uh, Black and Latino, young uh, gay and bisexual boys and men. Um, there's a very little research on, on that particular uh, group of folks who are experiencing it partner violence. Um, do work at, particularly on my dissertation research, which is um, an outgrowth of this session, um, also looking specifically at this idea of love from educators, organizers, activists, other change agents. And I asked them the simple question, so what is the role of love in social transformation? And so what you'll begin to see today is sort of a combination of sort of the, that particular research um, and the years, the cumulative years that I've been sort of working this particular piece. Um, but I am hail from Baltimore, uh, Maryland, uh, born and raised. Um, I have spent most of my time uh, engaging uh, leadership teams through Love and Justice Consulting uh, around sort of rethinking and helping to sort of thought partner to really sort of what does it mean to embed and move from theory to practice as we begin to do this racial justice work. Um, and uh, again, uh, spending time uh, over the last several years specifically focusing in on issues of intimate partner violence prevention, HIV uh, prevention for young people, um, as well as uh, thinking deeply about sort of uh, intersectional injustice and the things that we need to do as a side as a whole to begin to shift or change. And so typically this is an interactive workshop, um, usually ranging anywhere from three hours uh, to two, two and a half days. Um, you're getting the webinar version. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna be sharing a lot of information. So please, um, if you, as I'm moving through, if you have questions, uh, you can drop them into the chat or you can sort of wait, because um, I won't be able to track the chat in the moment. Um, we'll collate that so that I can answer any questions that might come up for you uh, towards the end of this particular session. Um, just a quick note on language. Um, I wanted to sort of lift some because these are the words that I'll be using and I just kind of want to begin to align us. And so when, I'm when you hear me say racism, I'm actually talking about a system of advantage based on race uh, that is supported by institutional structures, um, policies and practices that create and sustain benefits for the dominant group. And because we're talking about race in this moment, that dominant group is for, for white folks. Um, specifically, um, when you hear me talk about structural oppression, I'm not just talking about institutional practices, policies and procedures. I'm actually talking about things big, broad, like history, our lineage, our, lineage, our, our culture, the ideological frameworks that begin to govern um, our public policies. Um, but all of those things sort of working together to maintain a racial hierarchy with some folks, particularly white folks on top and uh, people of color uh, sort of at the bottom. And so that's what I mean when I'm talking about structural oppression. Um, because uh, my research was really centered around the experiences of, of Black LGBT uh, sort of cultural workers, those are uh, educators, organizers, um, teachers, uh, social justice activists, racial justice uh, educators. Um, this idea around compulsory heterosexuality becomes really important. So I had to name heteronormativity specifically because I'll use it throughout the presentation as the assumption that heterosexuality um, is the default uh, sexual orientation. And then particularly around compulsory heterosexuality that um, it's a belief system and a bunch of assumptions that everyone is or should be heterosexual. Um, and then that is considered normal. Um, and then it's enforced through our cultural values, policies, practices um, within our families and our communities. And lastly, uh, the last thing on language specifically, you'll hear me talking about is about white supremacy, um, which is the idea that white people's thoughts, feelings, beliefs, and actions are somehow superior to the thoughts, feelings, desires, actions of, of uh, people of color. Um, and what is important to note that white supremacy is not, not uh, just embedded in white folks, it is an ideology and we're all swimming in it. Um, and it's everywhere and it's pervasive and it shows up in all different manners of space. And so I wanted to just offer that as a note of language uh, as I begin to sort of move you through this presentation. And so uh, pretty simple flow for today. Um, we finished our welcome. Uh, hey y'all. Um, I talk a little about the context and the framing, why love? Um, and then to move us through sort of uh, a frame that I sort of put together, which is I talk about as a critical theory of love framework, uh, and then to sort of just have a close up wrap up and any reflections and questions and answers. Pretty straightforward. So why love? So first thing first, um, as I entered this work, probably as an undergraduate student uh, 20 years ago, um, I had been obsessed with the idea of love. Um, particularly Dr. King's notion and how he used love as an organizing framework for the civil rights movement. So that's what I was doing for my capstone research um, in my small liberal arts college in Maryland at St. Mary's College um, 
to begin to sort of understand sort of the relationship between love and its political implications. And I was understanding that through um, the work and uh, live experience and activism of Dr. King. Um, and then I picked it up again in my dissertation research um, uh, in 2012 through 2017, uh, where I began to really think more deeply about uh, what does it really mean, uh, love as an organizing framework to help move us through, uh, and to also sort of lift up some of the blocks and the roadblocks that it provides. But um, for me, why love? Um, I believe that um, folks, love is really important, and then particularly because it is a core aspect of our human experience, and it is actually necessary and vital for our health and well-being, mental, spiritual, physical, emotional, uh, sexual health. Love is a core and uh, central part of that. We know that when people are loved and loved well and loved in holistic ways, they uh, have better uh, mental health, they have less uh, stress uh, that lives in their bodies, uh, and they have more access to sort of the things that make them grand, uh, fundamentally who and what they are. Um, and that becomes sort of a, a basic necessary need of humans is to be loved um, and to experience good quality love. So that is the broadest sense. But as we begin to dig in deeper, um, we also begin to see that love is not only just a, a necessary human experience, um, and sort of uh, need for our well-being, it actually becomes a major socializing framework that impacts us when we think about sort of how we begin to relate through power. Um, particularly if you start to consider race, gender, or sexuality, um, and the social scripts, the things that we've learned in our families, our communities, our places of faith and worship, um, what we begin to see is that when you think about love, there are particular parameters set on it, um, and it begins to sort of govern who you can engage with, who you can connect with, um, and then how people can relate to each other. And so when you start beginning to peel the layers of this idea of love back, that's what becomes forefront when you start interrogating it um, and not allowing it to sort of be some whimsical fairy tale um, that love is something you're supposed to fall into in reality, um, that we start looking at it uh, more systematically um, and asking questions of sort of what does good love do um, for us? What does it allow and make possible? Um, and then what do other forms of love do that don't sort of serve us? Um, we get to start in, in engaging in the, that particular question. This other piece is around that it's also a major social organizing phenomenon, specifically when we think about gender. Um, so when we think about uh, norms and expectations, this traditional everyday notion of love, it is steeped in heteronormativity. It suggests that love is only for straight folks um, and it's only for folks who exist within a gender binary, so male and female. And if you live outside of that, uh, love is then not for you or you don't have access to it. Um, or you're not deemed worthy of it. And so again, when we start digging into this very sort of traditional notion of love, that's what we begin to see. Um, and more importantly, um, it begins to suggest who can enter into what kinds of relationships and with whom. And that's when we start seeing sort of acceptability and respectability politics. If anybody has um, uh, followed The Body, which is an HIV pu uh, publication, um, a uh, sort of long-term activist uh, and scholar, uh, Kenyon Farrell, um, talked about sort of uh, the challenge between this moment in respectability politics where the LGBT movement, um, when we've sort of uh, won merge equality, um, the question was asked, well, is that what most of us really want? Um, and then the question became, um, I'm not sure, especially if you're talking to black and brown folks uh, who are LGBT. Um, and so uh, the main argument had been like, if we as LGBT folks are more like straight folks, if we do that, then we'll have greater access to resources, opportunities, et cetera. Um, not realizing, or some of us not realizing that if we did that, um, there are still a lot of folks who live and exist outside of the binary um, and uh, the ways in which then they would be sort of further marginalized and pushed to the borders. And so uh, that's what we mean sort of looking at gender um, specifically. And then lastly, labor, again, around norms and expectations. Who has access to what roles, what professions are open, um, what opportunities do you have, um, and sort of what is considered actual um, work and uh, for whom? And I often see this uh, sort of talked about in the terms of what is uh, sort of hard work and soft work. Um, so hard work being sort of things that are sort of out, you're doing with your hands, it's externally facing. Um, and then the soft stuff is actually the things we are dealing with emotions and feelings, et cetera. But when you start looking at this traditional notion of love, that's actually just embedded 
um, sort of anti-fem uh, femininity and anti-women sentiments uh, in there because women had quote unquote historically been sort of uh, considered soft and they had to address issues uh, of emotional labor and men had to just provide and didn't have to do in the emotional work um, in that space. And so um, we know that that's also not true. And then we know that it, that is a particular problematic dynamic um, when we think about um, the unnecessary burden that women in uh, gender non-binary uh, and sort of femme identified folks have to carry uh, while they're doing their work. And so again, all of that's embedded in this very normative everyday notion of love. And specifically, um, I believe love it, and when I think about it, as a political project and not political in the sorts of um, our sort of legislators and that sort of thing, but pol uh, political in the sense of it's every day and it's informing um, power and our relationships. Um, and what it means to me is that um, understanding love and interrogating becomes important because actually um, love ascribes and confers value. It designates who matters and who is disposable. And that depending on the type of idea around love you carry in your brain, um, it begins to destructure who is desirable. Um, and it begins to suggest and to sort of enforce um, who is actually worthy. Uh, and, and because of that, um, it also begins to sort of determine to what degree someone or something will act on your behalf. And I believe this is what makes love a political project because when we don't interrogate the found, uh, fundamental idea of it, um, we just rely on everyday notions that are steeped in heteronormativity to decide who's valuable and who's not. And in this particular structure, in the uninterrogated structure, the folks who are disposable are LGBT, genderqueer, non-binary, uh, trans folks, et cetera. Um, and then we're sort of further marginalized um, and sort of uh, pushed out. And so a part of the things that I learned in my research um, was that um, when I had the conversation about love at the intersection of oppression, um, one of the things that became very clear to me that when in the absence of a robust definition uh, of love, uh, a love that sort of does justice as Dr. King had talked about, it actually leads to at least these three conditions that I see uh, most often, sort of deprivation that folks are walking around deprived of a natural um, and necessary fundamental need. Um, and they, because love is not coming to them, it's not flowing through them, it's not moving toward them um, because they might be black or LGBT or both and, and sort of differently abled, um, all of those systems of inequality come together um, to, to produce some people sort of operating and existing in a state of deprivation. Um, and then sort of moving through that process, uh, depending on the intensity of their own lived experience, navigating trauma at their individual level, at their family level, their community level, um, let alone systems of inequality, homophobia, racism, anti-homophobia, I'm sorry, uh, uh, anti-transphobia uh, 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 initiatives, all of these things also begin to sort of produce uh, despair uh, and desperation. And desperation is when we start to feel like completely hopeless, that there's things that are profoundly wrong with us and that the world around us won't change. And that when we don't have a robust and a political definition that requires us to consider the full richness of who and what we are, um, and then to demand systems change it to honor all of us, um, we also see this piece around desiccation that uh, from my work, I was able to see that there were so many people who had been so badly wounded, um, who had been burned in their relationships, that their parents had may not have given them the things that they needed to survive and thrive on top of the broader systemic issues that told them every single day that they were unlovable and unvaluable. Um, what we talk about is sort of seeing this as a, a state of desiccation. Um, and I had started gardening um, when the pandemic hit. Um, and so I've been spending a lot of time uh, thinking about sort of what does it really mean for something to be desiccated? And that is to mean to be fully dried up um, and dried out. And one of the questions that I'm often asked um, sort of is uh, uh, is love something that sort of can revive us and restore us? And, uh, and I believe that it can, um, but our strategies might need to look different for a person who has existed and existing in a state of deprivation because they have not been loved well. Um, uh, the thing about desiccation is that you're just dried up and that you actually need to be submerged deeply in water for you to be revived and restored. Um, so it's not dead, it's not gone, it is just dry. 
And you can't just dip it in once and expect it to be rejuvenated. You actually have to sit it in a vase or a body of water. And for over time, it will naturally become uh, alive again and retake its shape. And so for me, that's the positive and powerful possibility of sort of love as a rejuvenative practice. Um, but knowing where people are and sort of what they're experiencing, um, knowing that you might need to sit in a space where you feel loved and you feel honored for a while um, before you can feel reconnected with yourselves and um, to sort of move through uh, this life in a way that uh, honors you uh, and yourself, and then to sort of work through all of the internalized um, uh, oppression that we might have adopted sort of living and navigating life at this intersection. And so one of the things that um, sort of making the connection further is that I see is that when we start seeing the desperation, despair, and desiccation, those actually begin to overlap with our trauma responses. When we are not loved well, what might happen? Um, in the context of broader systems and at the interpersonal level and within our communities, you might sort of see us um, responding in any of these traditional ways that we talk about trauma responses. Um, you might see folks operating in fight or flight, um, sort of uh, sort of feeling deep anger and sort of not knowing how to sort of sort of move through that. You might have folks showing up um, in panic and worry um, and perfectionism. Um, you might see folks sort of demonstrating and sort of uh, disassociating from their bodies. Um, we know that to be true for a lot of LGBT folks um, uh, who sort of uh, are existing uh, as non-binary or uh, gender expansive. Um, and then even for folks who are experiencing high levels of trauma, even being a, starting to disassociate from ourselves, um, our own being and our physical bodies. Um, and then this last piece around sort of fawn, where you might see um, folks who um, have not been loved really well and have actually might have been loved in ways that were hurt and destructive, uh, destructive and manipulative, uh, might be showing up um, in ways uh, that are codependent. That one of the ways that they be try to sort of position themselves to be worthy of love um, is to sort of uh, engage in people pleasing behaviors, for example, um, and sort of to not have any boundaries and to do everything and make all these sacrifices for everybody else, but not from themselves or not for themselves. And so um, you start to see uh, this broader sort of topic of love um, and oppression and the literal material uh, sort of manifestations in our body and our biological responses. And so I believe that becomes sort of one of the reasons why I think it's so deeply important for us to actually start having a robust uh, conversation about what love is, what do you need to feel love? Um, and if you don't know what it is to feel love, um, to spend some time digging in in that critical reflective practice to actually um, figure that out for yourself. And so in 2017, this was the one of the first articles out of my dissertation research. Um, uh, it, you can find it in the Journal of Critical Thought and Practice. Um, and so this work is based on that. And so uh, most of this presentation, I'd say 60% of this presentation is found inside of that article. Um, so if you're looking for the framework um, uh, to sort of go a little bit deeper in that, you can sort of uh, look at this article. But sort of what happened in this particular space in grad school, I, I was uh, in, I started my PhD program, and uh, I was in a, a, a progressive social justice oriented program, uh, and I'm sitting in a classroom with pri uh, primarily black and brown students, uh, and the faculty member uh, sort of said to a whole class of us that her job was to colonize us. And it was in that moment that I remembered feeling my body disassociate. I remember sort of losing my breath. I remember um, sort of looking around the room to other black and brown students, wondering sort of why would a person who um, sort of does and writes prolifically on social justice um, uh, would sort of say this to a, a, a class of black and brown students. And it was in that moment that I realized that they're at sort of at the largest level, um, an absence of a critical discourse on love. Um, and sort of my inclination was to then sort of go to the literature because I was in grad school and that's what we did. We had to look for the literature and, and figure out what's going on. And so that's what I did. I, I wanted to understand more about sort of what would lead an educator um, to say that to a classroom of black and brown students or anyone for that matter. And sort of one of the things that I sort of came up to and sort of with was uh, this here that sort of in our contemporary everyday discourses of love, love is often sort of talked about uh, almost exclusively as a uh, romantic, familial, um, or sexual nature, almost exclusively. And that there was very little discourse um, or way of being or talking that sort of had love exist outside of our individual uh, relations. 
There was no talk or hardly no talk about love in the community context. There was very little, if any, about love at the sort of broader sort of social political, um, sort of this broader, bigger uh, macro system. Um, so, uh, so they were told me that, that the everyday notion of love was already isolated to just the individual and those would be the family, um, uh, our romantic relationships and sex, that was it. But in that middle column, you see that there were these theorists who said, no, actually the, the role of uh, one, love has to be challenged. Um, it has to be interrogated. Uh, because it is a social phenomenon just like anything else. Um, and Eric Fromm was writing in the early 1900s um, and basically what he said that love had become a commodity. It was something that actually could be bought or sold. Um, and that if something uh, could be bought and sold, it actually becomes an object. Um, and that in this country, we saw that specifically through the proliferation of self-help books, all about love and it's all at the individual level. What can you do to change? Or what can you do to try to make someone else change to love you more, things like that. Um, and sort of what he offered in that particular moment uh, was that we had to pay attention to the ways in which our society had made love a product to be bought and sold. Um, Bell Hooks then comes in and adds in layers of nuance and, and particular systems level analysis. So she talks specifically about um, the relationship between love and domination and control. And basically what she says, um, patriarchy, misogyny, um, sexism, all of those things were embedded in the everyday notion of love um, and that love could not exist where there was violence. And she pushes really hard against um, the ways in which this society and patriarchy and misogyny specifically um, negatively impacted women um, and, uh, and sort of other folks as well. Dr. King, of course, was organizing um, uh, sort of uh, the civil rights movement as a sort of face and sort of made it very clear that love had to not just be an individual sort of uh, re individual reaction or a relationship or with you and your family, because uh, if that was the case, we'd never reach broader social civic engagement uh, enough to, to change structural policies. Um, and that so much of his organizing around the civil rights was about and for love, but not in this everyday notion of love that is exclusive to our romantic relationships. But in fact, it was about understanding that love at a broader social and political perspective was about fundamentally reorganizing our society so that all of us could be well, that we could all be free and that we could all have rights and have access. Um, which we saw today and sort of over the last few months and maybe a year or so um, have been stripped. The Civil Rights um, Act uh, and everything that it provided is being systematically dismantled. But for Dr. King, it says, if your love is only having you to be thinking about you and your partner and maybe your grandparents or something like that, um, maybe we need to revisit what your idea of love is because love has to have us um, to be organizing and doing advocacy work out in the streets and lobbying um, and voting so that we can actually see broader systemic change. Um, James Cone uh, sort of then also adds in uh, at that time, uh, wrote Black Liberation Theology. And he said, first of all, uh, God has to be uh, on the side of the oppressed and sort of walks us through um, the ways in which white supremacy had used scripture specifically to uh, keep Black folk enslaved and justified as a practice. Um, and he sort of, what he brought in was like, that is not the God of my understanding or my knowing, but specifically that um, uh, that God had to be on the side of the oppressed um, because he was about the, the, the breaking of chains and inequality and making sure that folks had uh, food and shelter and clothing. And so that was his offering to this idea of love that was particularly um, beyond an individual uh, level of analysis, but it had individual communities, um, institutions and our broader system implicated uh, in that as well. And Paul Tillich was a, a philosopher uh, who said that uh, love and power and justice had to go together. Uh, that if you um, had love, um, but without power, it was uh, echoing Dr. King, uh, it was gonna be weak and anemic. And if you had power without love, um, it would be uh, sort of violent. Uh, and so Paul Tillich said that they actually had to go together and that people had to begin to own their power, because what love was going to require of them, particularly uh, in the face of ongoing systemic inequality and oppression, it was going to require you to be strong enough um, to sort of sustain yourself and others and to nourish them in order for them to stay in the fight for ongoing social, racial justice, intersectional justice. Um, and so all of that, and so um, our everyday notion 
didn't have a power analysis attached to it. These critical theorists have said, no, we have to add that in because otherwise we won't be able to move society forward. Um, and then ultimately what I sort of arrived at uh, was that this idea of love and particularly a critical theory of love, it's about unmasking and showing where power is and how it's moving through and that it wasn't innocent. And it actually functioned as an ideology. The fact that when we think about love, when I thought about love specifically, I was sort of on my stuff. Uh, the first thing that came to mind was um, Disney fairy tales. It was uh, Ariel uh, wanting to leave her family to go uh, and be with this man at, at, in the castle. And she wanted legs and all these things. Um, and the only thing, that was the only thing I could think about or Twilight. So all of these individual sort of stories of love and romance would had love to be whimsical, but had nothing to do with the ways in which love had to be a political project in order to move society uh, uh, and to develop policies and practices that helped advance all of us and made sure that we were all well and all whole, um, meant that the, the, the socialization was actually effective. The fact that most of us could not generate uh, a list of love uh, that held community that held our groupness, that held policy and political implications, um, meant that this broader socialization structure was indeed working. And that all of that together was steeped in colonization. Um, it was based in white supremacy um, and patriarchy, uh, that it was all about sort of maintaining racism and heterosexism. And all of that's embedded in our everyday notion of love. And these middle folks in this category said, you have to understand the relationship between love and power and love and broader social change. Otherwise, you're just gonna allow for the reproduction of colonization, white, some white supremacy, patriarchy, and so forth to be embedded and to have it to persist um, in sort of how we relate to love and how we love each other. And so I wanna talk a little bit about sort of um, the dangers of not having a critical definition of love and specifically how that definition uh, that you might have perpetuates white supremacy. So when we don't challenge the very notion of love itself, um, we begin to see it perpetuating white supremacy because it begins to sort of says uh, that we choose um, our head and our reason um, at the expense of our bodies and our emotions. It actually then sort of prioritizes the individual level versus our community wholeness. It says things like produce, 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 productivity at, at all costs, that's just capitalism. <laughs> um, and that it also sort of centers in, and based principally and practically in practices of domination, um, in our relationships, in our jobs, in our places of faith and worship, in our communities, instead of uh, mutuality and consent. And that when we don't challenge this very idea of love, it ultimately leads to dehumanization, um, the devaluing of certain types of lives um, over um, others. It, it lifts up some as sort of being uh, the best image uh, while discrediting um, and minimizing and belittling uh, those who uh, are, are different and live outside of that normative box. And I think some of the damaging effects of that specifically was a talk about dehumanization. What I was able to find and sort of when I do this work across the country that we begin to see a practice of dehumanization. A part of it is be, uh, seen and demonstrated in um, folks self-sacrificing themselves and particularly around women and um, femme identified folks um, sort of saying, oh, I have to do this for my family. Um, I have to, I have to, I have to, um, I have to care for them. I have to do at the expense of their own self, their own agency, their own literal physical, mental, um, emotional well-being. We also see the effects of not having a sort of a critical definition of love, a love that sort of uh, has an eye on power. Specifically, we see that as um, another effect of around disempowerment. Um, we have people walking around sort of feeling like they are unworthy. Um, and because they're unworthy, uh, they will do anything to please somebody else. Um, and that sort of when that pleasing does not work out, um, they begin to sort of uh, own and sort of internalize that that is actually their fault. Um, and, uh, you know, relationships and things are complicated. Um, everybody got a role, but it's the when we sort of take that to heart and then sort of completely disempower ourselves um, and we lose our voice and we lose our agency. Um, we begin to sort of create our space and we could create ourselves as objects um, and that, oh, I want to be loved. And so uh, I want to be a trophy person. I want to be a trophy wife, husband, husband, a, a, a trophy, any of that. Um, all of that's about objectification. Um, and going back to what um, uh, sort of the, one of the philosophers was talking about when we see the commodification of love as something that could be bought and sold. 
this piece around loss of voice and a sense of self is really, really important to me because that's where I struggle the most, uh, if I'm honest. Um, that sort of, uh, when I begin to reflect on my life and the types of relationships that I had, um, navigating sort of my uh, sort of homophobic place of faith and worship, um, one of the things that I realized very quickly um, is that uh, because I wasn't loved well, I never had a understanding of what it meant to be loved well. Um, all I had was, um, love had to be conditional. It had you had to sort of please other people. Um, if you didn't love them, uh, they pull away their love. And then um, one of the things I think as a result of that was the loss of my voice and a sense of myself. Um, and particularly when I think about my voice, it is it's not my literal vocal cords, but it's um, sort of my self expression. It's the, the way in which I sort of show up it had been altered because at the back of my head I was always walking around with the internal script that I'm unlovable. Um, which sort of impacted sort of how I sensed and sort of uh, my self-esteem and then sort of my sense of self. Um, also this piece around um, when we don't sort of challenge this idea of love, particularly for black and brown folks and BIFOC folks specifically, that it actually begins to embed within us a distrust and a mistrust of our own bodies and our experiences. We begin to sort of choose head and reason around things like safety, um, and say, oh no, I'm gonna be okay, that's fine. Or I stay in a place too long, like I'll, I'll suffer it out or whatever, I'll wait it out. But literally our bodies are being deteriorated in that process. And then when our body is trying to signal, send us signal, signals around like, I'm afraid I need to leave this place, um, we actually silence our own bodies and sort of suppress those feelings. Uh, and then ultimately leads to uh, distrust and mistrust of our bodies. Um, and a misreading of all of that feeling as something bad. In reality, uh, the, your body's primary function is to, to try to protect you and to keep you alive and keep you safe. And so when we sort of disconnect from our body and only operate from our head, um, uh, we sort of uh, create the conditions again for our own disempowerment, um, objectification, um, and ultimately um, disassociation. And then ultimately this piece around lack of self-esteem that, uh, Folks who have not been loved well and who do not have a robust definition and understanding of love um, also struggle the most in being compassionate with themselves. And one of the things that I believe is really important for us um, and uh, the need for this conversation is that I've gotten clear recently that um, everything that we do uh, to change, to grow, um, to advance ourselves will fail if we do not have a practice, a sustained practice of self-compassion. because in the absence of self-compassion, even if we mess up one time, we'll spiral and begin to berate ourselves. And the practice of self-compassion says, no, actually let's stop. You did your best in that particular moment. Let's learn what we learned and then try it again. And so without that sort of thrust that self-compassion allows for us, um, we get stuck in our spirals of guilt, shame, blame, um, and won't be able to sort of grow and sort of move forward. And so what have I sort of come to at, at this body of work um, so from my perspective, um, the kind of love that we need to sort of um, shoulder systemic inequality, um, to help sustain us um, as we're sort of fighting uh, the good fight for um, continued rights uh, for everybody in this country, um, that the kind of love that we need is one that um, is deeply based in healing, liberation, and justice. And I think a part of that definition for me, the purpose, one of the biggest purposes of love in this new way, this reconceptualized way of thinking that then love is about the mutual co-construction of our full personhood. If you're with somebody or in an organization or in a place that is not co-constructing, that is to see, to help you be for, more fully who you are, to help you sort of reach your greatest potential, then maybe that's not the space for you, or maybe it's not love. And it took me years to figure out this definition of what love was, and specifically um, uh, several years of therapy that when I had to figure out what a definition was, and this doesn't have to be your definition, but as a starting place, that then love for me um, in this particular context, this operational definition is the capacity will encourage to nourish and affirm yourself, another, and community toward unapologetic wholeness, completeness. That if I wanted to know um, if I was loving folks in my community well, I'd be asking questions uh, of myself and the ways in which I'm showing up. Is my practice aligned with ensuring that other people feel unapologetically themselves? Do they feel complete? Do they feel nourished and they whole? And that is a practice and a question that I get to ask myself if I'm engaged in a practice of critical reflection and to begin to use that as a measuring stick or a lens 
to see if my sort of social justice practice, because if you would have asked my professor um, who told me that her role was to colonize us, um, she thought that she was doing social justice work too in that particular moment. But what she was doing, she was doing conceptual work. She didn't care about our bodies. She didn't care about our feelings um, because our bodies and our feelings had been erased um, in the academy, um, but also um, uh, this country has a, a specific history of erasing um, the, the, the bodies um, and the feelings of BIPOC folks and specifically Black folk in this country. And that's sort of the purpose of a, sort of a critical theory of love in this way that I begin to, to rethink this idea of love itself is that one, it at least has to have these three things going on. That one, it has to help us resist erasure and dehumanization. If the relationships, if the places that you're with, the people that you're with are not helping you to feel more strong and able and capable um, to resist erasure from systems um, that we see happening um, of, of oppression that we're experiencing right now with the Scoutist decision uh, around affirmative action and LGBT rights, um, allowing businesses to discriminate against us. Like if you're in relationships and spaces that are not helping you to resist that erasure, and that dehumanization, um, you might want to reconsider uh, if that's a place of really uh, that's able to hold and love you. The second piece I'd say that love would have to be able to do is then um, it has to be about facilitating your own healing. Again, are the places that you're in a helping you to move through and move toward healing? Is it helping you to, to feel more grounded and more connect, connected to your truth? Or are they silencing you? And so again, if it's again, I think at least these three purposes, um, there might be more for sure, but if the spaces that you find yourself aren't helping you to feel more whole and make you sort of uh, rethink sort of you yourself constantly in a way that um, helping you, helps you advance, I'd ask uh, um, the question of whether or not that's the space for you uh, without judgment. Uh, and then this last piece that it would help resource you, your voice, um, your at the individual and collective space, that they'd be not only resourcing you in a material sense, but offering you energy, wisdom, support, nourishment, encouragement, affirmation. Um, that sort of, if I'm thinking about a robust definition of love that will help us sustain us, our fight in this movement, that these are the least three things that love would have to be able to do in order to help us sort of sustain ourselves. And so from some of the uh, conversations uh, that I had with folks, um, I was able to develop some principles of a critical theory of love. And sort of what, so this is some of their wisdom and sort of wisdom that I've sort of gained over the last uh, five years still um, cultivating this body of work. Um, and what they were telling me was that sort of uh, one of the principles of this new idea or this critical theory of love, not the everyday notion of love that we sort of see in the television and the, these Disney fairy tales, but really um, in, uh, in a really intentional way that love has to be about self-work and it has to be self-work in services of self-discovery and affirmation. It has to be about sort of BIPOC folk sort of creating and taking up space, um, developing practices of self-compassion, um, that love has to be considered a sacred covenant and not necessarily in the religious sense, um, but recognizing the inherent dignity and value in all life. Um, and that's uh, one of the things that the, I thought was a really important point that a lot of folks was like, okay, you know, typically we hear, you know, um, things about unconditional love. Um, and folks were like, well, actually, um, that's not what I need. What I need is to figure out how to love with boundaries because my challenge is that I need to figure out how to maintain my own sense of self and agency while I'm in relationship with other people who might see me as an object or might see me as a means to an end or who might sort of see me in my family dynamic um, uh, and sort of put demands on me without even asking permission. Uh, and so for them and for me, um, and particularly in this frame, uh, that love then is not about unconditional love. It is about how do we begin to love with boundaries um, and that knowing that sort of creating the boundaries and helping and, and let the measuring stick of whether or not someone really loves you is by the degree in which they actually um, respect those boundaries. Um, number four, specifically around love, has to be an anti-oppressive and liberated, a liberatory practice, that you have to have an analysis of power um, and helping folks reclaim their power to heal. That fives that, it also has to be an act about, about individual and communal regeneration, that we're sort of honoring our ancestors, we're honoring the people in our lives who helped uh, us maintain and our sense of agency, our sense of self-worth, um, and developing a practice of reverence of our bodies, of our minds, of our community members, of all different kinds and types. Um, and that sort of when we begin to do these practices, these engage these principles, um, that our definition of love becomes much not only much more 
robust, but it also begins to orient us to help us understand um, what are the best places for us to be and exist in, um, and then to think about sort of the places that we might need to leave um, just so that we might be able to feel more grounded, more centered, and more connected. And so a lot of this work is also thinking about the functions of love then. I think of functions are at least this. And so when I think about sort of a critical theory of love, um, that this first piece around protection, um, that if you love something, you protect it, you cherish it. And that's protection from mental, physical, emotional, or spiritual uh, sort of sexual abuse. That you have to be able to sort of, um, if I really love you, that one of my pro top priorities to make sure that you're well and you're protected is one of the core pillars uh, and the core functions of love in this particular way. That then the second piece is around nourishment. That so it's helping me sort of feel nourished for my own sense of agency, self-compassion, helping to sort of increase and enhance our self-esteem um, and our critical awareness of not only ourselves, but of the world. That sort of in this, uh, this other sort of rethinking of love and sort of a critical theory of love as I talk about it, uh, specifically, it, it's about safety. And that's safety from erasure and dehumanization that I talked about already, um, but also from eternal, internalized oppression. Um, and, and helping folks release the internalized scripts that they have adopted, um, whether out of survival and their trauma response or not, um, the belief that sort of they're not worthy or they're um, somehow because of their black or queer or um, intersex or sort of differently abled, that they're somehow not worthy of love. Um, and we have to figure out how and what conditions and practices help folks release those negative stereotypes and those internalized uh, scripts. Um, so that they can be whole and they can be free. Um, we also have to create safety from sort of disempowerment and then ultimately um, uh, from isolation. And that particular piece around isolation uh, is that uh, when folks are sort of going through and navigating uh, systemic inequalities, in addition to sort of dynamics that they might be experiencing at the individual community and the group level, one of the tendencies is to pull back and to isolate. But what we know um, in this work that around particularly around healing trauma uh, that we actually uh, some work can be done as an individual but that doesn't mean in isolation always and so we need to come together as a community to figure out and create spaces for us to heal collectively um, and in community uh, as a sort of core uh, and a core foundational piece of this rethinking of love uh, in this critical way and then ultimately um, defense that if you love something not only are you going to protect it you're going to defend it against assaults threats exploitation and and marginalization. And that if I'm wondering, and even in this moment, the degree in which other folks love me as a not Durrell, um, which I think I'm a nice human being, but as a black gay man um, with uh, sort of some uh, hidden disabilities, if you will, that, that I'm asking and looking for like, who's gonna be standing up for me? Who's gonna be protecting my interests, my rights um, to sort of be fully who and what I am in a world and not have to hide, um, to not be in shame because um, I don't meet expectations of um, what does it mean to be a good anything, put good, put the X, whatever you wanna put in there. Um, so again, this is uh, a way in which I begin to reimagine um, a love that's strong enough to help us resist systemic uh, oppression and erasure uh, in this particular political moment in time. And so as a framework then, um, I offered this, that sort of if I'm trying to begin to assess my programs, my practices, um, I'm designing something, I see this as an emergent practice that sort of if I wanna sort of think about the degree in which I'm engaged in a critical love, a love that really um, seeks to hold our humanity and our fullness, um, that it at least has to do these six things. One, it would have to affirm uh, individual social and cultural identities and their full personhood. That there was no way uh, for me to sort of tell you or say that I love you um, and not have a sense of your identity, your, histori uh, your historical legacy, um, your cultural identities, um, and so forth, because those are the things that make you up. Um, that I'd be asking questions and understanding the historical and contemporary context in which those folks exist um, and have existed. Um, that I'd have to understand how power and systemic oppression dehumanizes um, those particular folks that it would become impossible for you to say that you love me and then to say at that same breath that you don't see race or you don't see color. Um, that if you don't understand how systems are systemically hurting me, um, there's no way for you to generate solutions um, to get at the root of those pains. And then to, ultimately you wouldn't even be able to sort of create the conditions for me to heal. 
Ultimately, um, they'd also have to do things um, that centers those person's lived experiences. And it would actually have to begin to co-create um, rehumanizing practices that help folks reheal. Uh, and sometimes, uh, particularly in these top-down cultures, it is like, oh, I know best because I'm a content expert and I'm a this and I'm a that. No reality is, is that you know your truth and they know theirs and people are the experts in their own lived experiences. And so when we're thinking about creating um, a robust or a critical theory of love uh, that teaches uh, and sort of encourages fullness and wholeness, uh, that we would actually have to co-create that truth. Um, and that's as a part of the definition um, or it's the function in, in my mind, it's the co-construction of our full personhood. That's how I know I'm in a deeply radical and loving and transformative and liberatory uh, sort of loving relationship. That it would also have to teach embodied knowledge and it would have to educate for wholeness and completeness. And what I mean by that again, is that we have to teach the body. We have to sort of engage in a practice where we honor it, understand it, acknowledge it and not try to suppress its feelings not trying to sort of uh, sort of disassociate from our bodies um, for head and our reason. That's white supremacy. If it just has us bifurcated or separated from ourselves, um, that we have to acknowledge that our bodies actually have history. They have memories. Um, and that sort of not only is trauma passed down through generations, uh, so is our legacy of healing and rejuvenation. Um, and so we need to figure out ways um, to lift that the, the, the lessons, the cultural systems, the, the things that have been transformed and sort of transmitted through our histories that helped us feel whole um, and helped our communities and our ancestors sustain, we need to be able to call that forth. And I think when we begin to reconceptualize love in a way that can actually move us through greater systemic inequality, um, it would need to at least do that. And this last piece around um, that it would have to measure how effective our methods uh, are at stopping oppression or minimizing it um, and the degree in which it actually creates our wholeness and completeness. And one of the things that I got clear about sort of in this research is that I was talking with one um, uh, sort of black woman, uh, black LGBT woman in my sample. Uh, and she said to me, uh, Darrell, if love is not measurable, how was I supposed to know I was supposed to leave my abusive relationship? And it was in that moment that I realized that uh, for us to have this whimsical fairy tale fantasy of, um, of love uh, is something that we can't touch because if we try to add words or to measure it, it somehow becomes meaningless, was actually um, a tool of white supremacist practice. Because uh, in that moment, I realized that for her, in the absence of any particular frame about sort of what love should look like and what it should feel like, it only allowed her to stay in the conditions of her own demise um, and to stay in an abusive relationship. And she didn't, she didn't even know. And I think in that moment, and again, that's not to say that folks need to be telling people to leave relationships, but what, it was a profound moment for me. And, my, and what I would say is that when I talk about measuring love, it is not some academic way of doing it. It is that every single day we have an opportunity to say to each other, um, after our conversation, did you feel more capable? Did you feel supported in that conversation? Um, and in real time, we actually get um, information because that person can say, you know what, it worked. I love that. I really appreciate how you held space or actually it didn't work for me. And then you can be in a conversation about why it didn't do um, what you might've thought it did in that particular moment. And so for me, um, if anything, uh, in terms of my contribution to the space, it is that um, love has to be measurable. It has to, we have to ask questions about um, after I left your presence, did you feel more like you were able to sustain um, your, yourself and the fight for racial justice? Did in that moment, did I offer you some energy or some guidance or some nourishment uh, for your soul in, in that particular moment? And so uh, again, I think uh, that when we don't engage in a robust conversation about love, um, when we don't rethink it, when we allow these everyday notions of love to permeate and, and not sort of understand uh, the, the political implications of it, we're actually not only harming ourselves, we're harming other people. Um, and, and, part, and we're definitely not giving them the, the space to, to heal and to grow. Um, just a reminder as I begin to wrap up, um, and it is strange that I have to say this, but it's true. I do it all the time. Um, love does not harm. It does not harm. It does not minimize us. It does not require uh, me, you, anyone to become smaller than who they are. And that love in this way that of how I think about it, it does not um, require uh, you to lose yourself and it does not force you to act out. Instead, it should help you resist erasure, which we've talked about. 
It should nourish and encourage your growth and your continued growth. And it should help you heal. Um, and not only heal, but to help you begin to pre prepare spaces for yourself and other peoples to heal as well. And ultimately at the highest level, um, I believe that love has to be redefined. I think love has to be embodied. We have to begin to sort of know it deeply within our bones and our flesh that then ultimately love would need to then be performed in our actions, uh, in our deeds, what we say, how we say it um, to the services of our holistic well-being, And that ultimately love needs to be measured um, because in the absence of measurement, um, folks will walk around with very little understanding about what love is. Uh, and more specifically, uh, we won't be able to get the feedback to ask the question of, uh, if the way that I think I'm loving you is right. Uh, and, and one of the things that I tell people all the time, um, and, and it sounds weird, but at the end of the day, uh, love is mutually constituting. That if you believe that the ways in which you're showing up is love and the other person tells you that great job, but that's not love to me, then it's not love. Because love has to be agreed upon. Otherwise it's just domination and control and manipulation. And so I wanted to just thank you all so much for your time. Um, one of the hardest things for me to do was to build a resource library because it was very little writing on this. So uh, folks can take a picture of this, reach out to me. Uh, this is just a beginning list of the things that um, I've been reading um, that have been pouring into me um, as we think about love and sort of what it really means. And uh, if folks want to reach out to me um, and continue the conversation, I am uh, would love to write a book. And um, one of the guys was like, well, you don't have enough uh, followers. So if folks could either like my Instagram um, or my LinkedIn, uh, that would be really helpful as I try to take this work and make it into a, a book um, a format as well. And so with that, I will say thank you, thank you, thank you very much for your your time and your energy and your, your patience with me. Uh, and I'm going to pass it over to Alexi to see if there are any questions, uh, comments. Uh, I'm super excited to hear what folks have to say. Thank you so much, Dr. Brooks. So much to pack, unpack and think about. Um, there aren't a lot of questions in the chat, but there's one throughout this whole thing that I could not stop thinking about. And I just, I am at this place, especially with listening to everything that you said. When, and I'm not even sure how to frame this question. When we think about, of course, it starts with self-love and our self-concept of love uh, from for ourselves, but then the internalization, the self-internalization of what is not love, because of course, as a people and of people, marginalized people, whatever you know, if your intersectionality is, if you experience the opposite of love, which is hate mm. on a constant level, and you're constantly um, feeling this hate and it's lived experience, you know, of, of every day of having to make yourself small, of having to, you know, feel oppressed, of, um, of always feeling that you could be harmed, even if you aren't watching media, watching news and seeing other people like you always experiencing that and knowing at any moment that you can feel that harm. Mm. Um, also, it's just with so much out there that is happening and we've talked about that, you know, we've talked about this. How can we get to a point where we can even have self-love for ourselves to be able to, to do the work of, of um, change and social justice and healing and help others to love when we can't it, it, how do we even find the love for ourselves yeah that is a robust <laughs> question um and the only way that i can sort of begin to um even think about answering that alexi honestly is that um i had to get really clear about what i was giving my energy and attention to I had to get really clear that most of the things in the places that I was operating in did not serve my well-being, my mental, physical, spiritual, emotional, none of it. 
And it was in the moment to choose my own sanity, my own health and well being, that I actually created enough space for me to then do the self work necessary to figure out where I was traumatized, um, the ways in which it was showing up in my body. Um, the ways in which it had me treating other people as subhuman, um, the way in which my own practice um, was based in sort of harm and all of the, so I had to begin to just sit with all of the fact that even in my own messiness and not having a good example of love, I was actively doing harm to folks um, all through the up and down there. You know, they called me energy vampire, like all of the stuff. Um, and it wasn't until I was able to take take several steps back um, with really profound mentors um, and a lot of therapy, honestly, to say, let me sit with this. Let me sit and figure out who Darrell is um, and let me figure out my core values so that I can then align my practices, my everyday practices to it. That is the way in which I actually started to create enough space for me to love myself and to love others in a more radical um, and transformative way. Um, because otherwise I, I, I would have never had space to because I'm always being, I'm always being hit every angle. From, from a family to mm. the scoutists, like, you know. And so I had right. to find a space. I had to make a choice. I had to make some ch decisions. Um, mm. Yeah. So no easy answer. It's definitely going to hold I, I, I can tell. <laughs> and that is profound because I'm sure all of us, all of us feel that way, um, constantly being pulled. And, and that was one of the things that really resonated with me as well when you're saying, you know, um, always pouring into other people and not yourself. Um, mm -hmm. And that I wanted to go back to also, you know, a um, continuation of what you just said, what you just said just now, because um, I was going to bring that up too, of having a space or, or, or making sure the spaces that you go in are uh, spaces where you can feel love. What happens if you are in a space that you cannot avoid though? Because mm -hmm. it's going to happen um, if you're in a space that you have to be there, even though it's not a space that you should or is a space for you. Yeah. Because a lot of us sometimes it's work, sometimes it's, you know, um, anywhere you go almost, uh, it can happen. So what do you do? How do you, uh, 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 what do you do if you're in that space and you can't avoid being there to protect yourself while you're in that space? I, and I think, um, you know, that's, uh, that's a tricky, that's a real spot. That's real, that's deeply real. And I think, um, you know, when I found myself in those spaces and I couldn't leave because there was no easy answer, like I still had bills to pay, I still had family to take care of, I had things to do. Um, I got clear that that's what I was doing. I needed to just self-preserve. Mm. Uh, and that meant I managed my energy, I managed my time. And Lord, like I had to develop some real critical self-care practices um, that helped me sort of reground and recenter outside of that workplace. Because every time I knew I was going back into that workplace, it was going to be a fight. I was going to be attacked for something I did or didn't do, what somebody believed about me or not. Um, and so if I'm in that space, I know I'm maintaining a, a sort of just preserving my energy. Um, I'm thinking about ways to say, um, find boundaries and um, also recognizing that sometimes you will be in those spaces until something changes radically. Um, either you find a, the, the, another out, another option, or um, the organization or the culture or the group that you're with changes. And um, you know, I think um, I'd say I spent the majority of my career in organizations where I just wasn't safe. You know, And I'm thankful now that that's just not my case and not my truth. Um, and one of the things that I'll, I'll say here is that Fear is the thing that kept me in my old job because I felt like I couldn't find anything better. And when I got let and let go, and as a practice of letting go of fear, I was able to then find some new, some not only beautiful, profound emotional revelations and sort of mental revelations, but I was also able to make a couple of different, different and better decisions to help get me into a different space. Um, and that's, you know, those are just practical things that I had to do to try to make it through some of these systems. Yeah, and that's that's even great advice, even on a personal level too, on a, especially on a personal level as well. To uh, and then of course, I like what you said about the creating the boundaries and uh, love is not unconditional. That really struck me because we all think, oh well, you know, unconditional love, unconditional love. But I do like I love that concept that you said love actually should have boundaries, and then 
to know that if you're truly being loved, right, the person who's respecting you, those boundaries, I felt like that was, uh, that really spoke to me as well. Um, I, I love that. I have a question too. Uh, you, you spoke of uh, creating spaces where we can heal collectively. Can you speak more on that? Can you um, kind of explain that a little more? Like what kind of spaces are you talking about? And like, how, what kind of spaces could we do? Like if we needed um, to heal or what kind of, or particular kinds of healing, what kind of spaces uh, would that look like? Yeah, and so um, a lot of the spaces that I sort of help create or curate or support are places where um, they're usually, not overly processed spaces. They're just spaces to be. It is to be in conversation about things that matter. So for me, that's one of those things is love, um, but also around self-care and healing and bringing people together literally just to engage and think and feel and be deeply uh, in a space of not only um, uh, spaciousness in terms of not having a rushed agenda and sort of moving from thing to thing, um, but then also um, in a, a, a type of uh, organic space where people get to be themselves. And so, you know, sometimes I'm just pulling a group of uh, work a lot around healing trauma. And so, uh, you know, so we're bringing folks together just to talk about different healing modalities, right? So, you know, a lot of the black and brown folks that I work with um, have never experienced Reiki before. So like, let me just bring a group of folks together and expose them to Reiki or sound healing, right? And then to have that 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 be the work, not sort of this overly academic, this overly heady stuff, but like really engaging in a practice that, um, uh, because there's no one way to heal. And so it's just helping people see that there's a suite of things that they can possibly do to help them navigate um, and move through, whether that's sound healing, dialogue, energy work, um, you know, so I'm, I'm just bringing folks together and, and with the strong facilitators to have space to kind of just see themselves reflected and, and mirrored and, and to be honest and transparent with each other about where they are. Yeah, that sounds great. I would love to be a part of some of those healing sessions as well, especially uh, the Reiki part, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I definitely could use some positive life energy uh, flowing especially in the work, you know, in doing this kind of work, you see so much um, that is the, you know, like I said before, the opposite of love. And it's, it's, it's um, like you said, it's, it's traumatizing sometimes and it's uh, very dehumanizing. And, you know, if you, if you see the sentiments, like you read one of the, the articles or you're on social media or Twitter or anything like that, which is one of those non-safe spaces that I need to um, stay away from, but uh, you, you see the sentiments of people and the hatred. And so what I was, one of the things, another thing that you said was that when people don't know our history or don't know, you know, our loved, our lived experiences, then they can't love us. And so, I, you know, it seems though that people are so actively trying to erase our history and our lived experience. And so do you feel like we'll ever be able to come to and be at a space um, of, of loving others because th it seems so hard for people to be able to love each other, uh, you know, be, especially and do you feel like the, that the the erasure of history and teaching in schools and banning the books and all of those things that are happening right now, you know, we talked about, you know, the, the court decisions. Do you feel like all of that is, per of course, it's purposeful, but do you feel that because of Dr. Martin Luther King's teachings, and it seemed like we were might have been going in that direction, that now this is a backlash to take us backwards because it seemed that we uh, people uh, were becoming unified and we're trying to become in a place of love. But uh, as soon as that happened, and any time it happens in history, it seems like there's this backlash. Do you feel like that is happening now? 
I, I think so. I, I think a lot about um, that um, for any progress uh, that I feel like this country makes towards deeper, more meaningful um, sort of the eradication of uh, inequities, um, that there is a equally or a stronger sort of negative reaction to that from a group of people, particularly those who have the legislative powers um, that, and in the media that begins to create sort of uh, and proliferate ideas of um, some people's inhumanity um, over others. And so um, I think we're constantly in this space of um, forward back, forward back, forward back. Um, but I think about um, uh, the, the places where I've seen change. I think about the places where I get to create it every day in my life. Um, I think about what it means for me to be able to create the conditions of my own wholeness and wellness, and then to offer glimpses of that to other people. Um, because if I don't have a groundingness in my own sense of self and my capacity to change and see things move forward, um, then everything around the world, everything in this country um, would have me stopped in my tracks and I would not be doing any work around any of these issues. <laughs> um, but I find such joy. And when I see people discover their voice, even in the face of opposition, I take so much joy when uh, some of the young people that I had sort of supported to do their anti-homophobia or transphobia work in their own communities, um, ran campaigns um, to sort of make their spaces more inclusive. Um, that brought me so much joy and continues to bring me so much joy. Um, when I see um, uh, folks uh, organizing in mass droves for for justice, I, I I think so. I have to be able to hold both truths, um, and but I just I definitely give more attention um, to sort of what I see people doing actively to resist erasure, mm -hmm. um, than just sort of being in the space of oh that's they just trying to erase us for sure. Okay, I love that. I love that. It's a, it's the way you're looking at things, and I love that. I will take that advice as well. <laughs> we'll definitely take that advice. And I, I really appreciate everything. I'm trying to I'd take it all in because I really want your two day, even your two day program because I want I want more. I want to, you know, learn more and do some exercises and you know, and uh, but thank you so much for giving us your time and thank you so much, you know, for taking time out of the conference that you are already at to do this, <laughs> for being here with us today. I really, really appreciate that. And so everyone, um, it was asked in the chat if you, he could provide the list of um, his resources again. And so in, in the chat, he put a link that you can click on to find him and, and his materials. And in the article that you brought up earlier too, Dr. Brooks, the article of reconceptualizing love that can be found. Yeah, so there. I can, absolutely. So let me just do, do, do conceptualizing. Yes, yeah, so I would like to so I can include that in our resources. Yeah, I would like to include that in our resources on our website. Drop that in the uh, chat right there. Um, uh, as well, thank you. And then, um, Alexi, if it's okay, I put up my site again, just in case people want to take my QR code. Um, yes, please. They didn't yes, that would be great. Get that one time. So mm -hmm. let me share that screen, just in case folks didn't see uh, the QR, should be able to scan that. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate um, the invitation um, to sort of be here. Um, and, you know, welcome all feedback. Um, I think it's uh, really, really uh, important for me and for my growth. And uh, so uh, if folks, you know, find me, reach out, uh, say what's up, say hello, you know, let me know what you're thinking about, um, what this might've stirred for you, what additional questions uh, might you might have, or like, oh, if you could talk or expand on this, um, you know, mm -hmm. that all of that helps me to sort of uh, have much more of a robust, um, so not only presentation, but it, it helps me grow uh, as well. So uh, I'm super, yeah. super appreciative. And the evaluation, everyone, um, the evaluation for this session is in the chat as well. So please, before you go, make sure that you click on that and complete it because your feedback is very, very important to us all. So please complete that. 
And uh, Dr. Brooks, will you please let us know when your book comes out? I'm looking forward to that. Thank you. <laughs> I'll definitely, you know, we do book discussions too. So I will definitely love to do a book discussion on your book if, when it comes out. So I'll be waiting to hear about that. And I'll be following you anyway. So I'll know. Yeah, <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> well, thank All you. Right. All right. Well, I'm thank gonna... you so much. It's so good to see you. And I appreciate you for inviting me in the space. And um, All right. You have a great rest of the weekend. Thank you. You too. Happy thank you. Holidays. And for everyone in the audience, um, please, please make sure that once again, that you complete the evaluation in the chat. And then also um, one thing I wanted to bring up before you all go, Hopefully that you are aware, but if you are not aware, please become aware that there is going to be a special election in August, on August the 8th. This is a very important election, even though a lot of people don't know about it, which is part of the problem. So we're going to put out a social media campaign and you'll be getting probably more information to share with your family, with your loved ones, to get out there and vote. You can start early voting on July the 13th, but keep in mind if you're not registered to vote or if you have young people or if you need to update your voter registration, the deadline to do any of that is July the 10th. And so that is coming up. There's 10 days, literally. So please make sure that you're, you're, uh, you know where to vote, make sure your voter registration is up to date. And if you have, if you know anyone, get them registered to vote and look for the email and we'll put out a, a, a voter registration. I mean, a voter guide, Ohio voter guide, they give you all the information, what's going to be on that ballot, um, all the deadlines and ways that you can just click on there and make any changes that you need to change. And other than that, um, please go to our website, www.ywcanwo.org to keep up with upcoming programs that we um we have coming up for July. Thank you, everyone. I'll give you back a few minutes of your time today and have a wonderful weekend. Oh, and please, if you would like a until justice justice shirt, click on um actually scan the QR code here and order a shirt. Because they're only available until July the 6th. And so please, uh, if you would like to have a shirt, go ahead and click on that and purchase a shirt and help us out also as well, because part of the proceeds will come to us. So once again, thank you everyone for being here today and I will see you all again soon. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye.